Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this Easter Sunday evening. My name is David. I'm one of the ministers at Corbus Church in Edinburgh, and it's my privilege to welcome you tonight. We're continuing our series entitled A Better Story, and I'm really excited about the topic that we're going to spend the evening thinking about together. It's conspiracy theories. We're asking the question, who's really in charge of the world behind the scenes? Now, in case you're wondering why on earth we're thinking about this on Easter Sunday, it's because the Bible records in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, that the first Easter Sunday marked the, the start of a conspiracy theory. Seeking to cover up the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, an elaborate and incredible story was invented by the governing elites. On pain of death, the soldiers who were guarding the tomb of Jesus were instructed to accuse the followers of Jesus, Jesus of having attacked them in the night and having stolen away the body. The implausibility of this story, though, that a group of ragtag, demoralized fishermen from Galilee took on the armed might of Rome and won, well, that was pretty hard to believe, hard to take seriously. Why is it that anyone would take that tall story seriously? Well, it's because it was more convenient to believe that story than what really happened. That a man who'd been certified dead just days earlier had risen again to life? What? Not just any man? But someone who claimed to be God come in the flesh, someone who had performed signs and wonders that caused crowds of people to be amazed at his supernatural power, and someone who had predicted that they were going to die and rise again before it happened. Well, the implications of that meant that it was so much more convenient to believe the conspiracy theory rather than to believe the true story that Jesus is Lord and God, that he reigns over heaven and earth, that he has authority over life and death of you, me, and everyone. Those implications were too much for many people who instead were more comfortable believing the conspiracy theory. So that's the link with Easter Sunday, and that's how we're going to approach our topic, Conspiracy Theories, tonight. The way it's going to work is there's going to be a 20-minute talk in just a minute or two, and we're going to explore the weird and wonderful world of conspiracy theories. All the way through that, you can ask questions. If you go to the website slido.com, perhaps on your phone or your tablet, slido.com, put in our event reference, which is 223-800, 223-800. You can post your questions throughout the talk. You can see the questions that other people are posting and vote on them, and we will spend half an hour after the talk engaging with your questions and exploring this topic in more depth and detail. Maybe around conspiracy theories, maybe around the evidence for the resurrection and the first Easter. Let's, let's go wild. Well, before we get into the topic tonight, I'd like to read to you two short extracts from the Bible. One from Mark's Gospel and then one from John's Gospel. And these are two particular stories that we're going to explore later on in the talk. Let me read to you Mark chapter 10, first of all, verses 35 down to verse 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus, saying, Rabbi, we want you to do for us whatever we say. Jesus asked, well, what do you want me to do for you? They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left hand in your glory. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the same baptism that I am? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. When the other ten disciples heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. But it should not be so among you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Our second reading this evening comes from John's Gospel, John chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go back to his father. 
Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and they had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped himself in a towel. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Down to verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place and asked, Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So we're going to come back to those two passages, Mark chapter 10 and John chapter 13, in a little bit later. But now let's get stuck into our topic for this evening, conspiracy theories. I have to confess a deep fascination with conspiracy theories. They're a fun way to pass time when you're struggling with insomnia. So let's begin tonight by playing a game that I call Conspiracy Th Theory Bingo. Let's see how many of these that you recognise. First of all, there's the Roswell incident. Some suggest it wasn't a top secret weather balloon that crashed in New Mexico. Rather, it was a UFO. It was taken away to Area 51 to be reverse engineered, leading to the subsequent computer revolution. Or what about the moon landings? Some suggest that we never actually landed on the moon in the 1960s. Instead, it was all a hoax done inside of a film studio in order for the Americans to beat the Soviets in the Cold War space race. Then there's the September 11th terrorist attacks. Some suggest that it wasn't actually an attack by Islamic terrorists. Rather, it was a government inside job using remote controlled planes, missiles, demolition charges inside the buildings to bring them down. All to justify conquest in the Middle East to steal the oil. Then more recently, there's the QAnon conspiracy. Some suggest that the US government is really controlled by the deep state, a group of satanic worshipping paedophiles allied with media and industry. But Donald Trump was going to stop them. That was until they stole the election from him. How about this one? The COVID pandemic. Some suggest it's actually a genetically engineered virus, a weapon spread using 5G technology, all part of a plan by the World Health Organization and the World Economic Forum to bring about the Great Reset. Bankrupting nations, restricting personal liberties, imposing universal socialism. And then there's the COVID vaccine too. Some suggest it's not medicine, but actually it's designed to reduce human fertility or to modify our DNA, or it's all part of a plot by Bill Gates to inject us with microchips to track us and control us, or at the least, at the very least, make us want to buy more Microsoft products. Well, what was your bingo score? How many of those six conspiracy theories did you recognise? Although some of these conspiracies can be a bit of harmless fun, others can be dangerous. They don't just stay as theories in an online world, but they can have real world implications and impacts. For example, look back to the insurrection in Washington DC, the attack on the Capitol Hill back in January. They sought to prevent the peaceful transfer of power after months of lies about the outcome of the election. Or for example, take the misinformation about the COVID vaccine, which is causing people in our country and all around the world to doubt its safety, to refuse to go and receive it. These conspiracy theories can have significant real-world impacts. But what I want us to explore together tonight is, why are so many people in our society buying into these conspiratorial and mythical ways of thinking about the world? Part of the answer is psychological in nature. Conspiracy theories reflect our innate ability as human beings to find patterns. They express our desire to make sense of our experiences in a complex world. We all want to know why things happen. We want to find meaning behind the seemingly random and unrelated events that dominate the world stage. The problem is that we're bombarded with so much information these days on a global scale that it's absolutely overwhelming. It's completely impossible to make sense of it all. And so it can be comforting to fall back on these grand conspiracy theories as a way of joining up the dots, a way of making sense of a world that otherwise seems senseless. 
Theologian and Mark Maynell has also reflected on two further factors that have led to the rise of conspiracy theories in our society. The first factor he identifies is the loss of trust in authorities. We're a generation that have lived through, in recent memory, the financial crash, the political expenses scandal, the newspaper phone hacking scandal, the WikiLeaks exposure of government surveillance, the spread of fake news by social media algorithms and many other such things. All of these things have cumulatively led to a loss of trust in the institutions that once were trusted to govern us, to inform us. There's this loss of trust in authorities and institutions. Closely related to that is the second factor, which is the rise of individual scepticism. Although we struggle to trust those in authority over us, we have invested ourselves with newfound trust. We have set ourselves up as the authorities of our own experience and interpretations of the world. And the roots of this way of thinking, this individualism, it goes back centuries to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment invested newfound confidence in human minds and their ability to make sense of the world in which we live. The Enlightenment promoted scepticism about all truth claims, all traditional authorities, especially spiritual claims and religious institutions. It tried to see through everything until it could find something that it couldn't see through, something that it couldn't doubt. But the problem with this kind of radical scepticism is that it's like a universal acid. It burns through everything it touches. And now, two centuries on from into the Enlightenment experiment, we have lost the things that once helped us make sense of this world and find meaning for our lives in it. It's this meaning crisis that has allowed conspiracy theories to blossom and flourish in our society today. They replace the religious stories that we have lost. They bring a sense of meaning and coherence to our lives that otherwise is lacking. In fact, some of these conspiracy theories are religiously shaped. For example, cultural commentator Mark Sayers suggests that the QAnon movement, it, movement is really a new false religion. It's centred on a messianic figure with secret knowledge that's available to the elect and who has promised to destroy the wicked on Judgment Day. Ironically, although people who believe in conspiracy theories often are very sceptical, they have invested great amounts of faith in these myths that there is someone or something behind the curtain with a grand plan orchestrating events on the global stage. And all of these things point to our culture being in the midst of a crisis of meaninglessness. Western secular society has discovered the hard way that a world without God is a world emptied of ultimate meaning and purpose. Our scientists tell us that we're just blobs of carbon floating from one meaningless existence to another. We're no longer adventurers on a great quest, but castaways adrift on the seas of nihilism. We're no longer pilgrims on the road to a destination, but wanderers and tourists on a never-ending journey. We're still avid consumers of stories, but we've stopped believing that there's a divine author who brings meaning and significance to the individual stories of our lives. And so instead we have to invent our own stories, or we have to embrace these grand conspiracy theories instead. Here tonight I want to suggest to you that there is a better way. The Bible tells the better story that's not only the answer to our individual and societal crisis of meaning, but it also fulfills the desires of our hearts because it is the true story of things that really happened in human history to Jesus and for us. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead on Easter Sunday, 40 days later his ascension to the throne in heaven answers tonight's question, who's really in charge behind the scenes of world history? And the good news is that it's not the Illuminati, it's not the Bilderberg Group, it's not the United Nations, it's not even David Icke's lizard people, it's the living Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, the realisation that there really is a God who rules the world, who is guiding history towards its destiny, it's not always received as good news by people. For example, the atheist philosopher Professor Thomas Nagel speaks for many people when he says, It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. 
in the back of Nagel's mind seems to be the generic idea of God as some kind of cosmic dictator or divine policeman or big brother figure. A God whose main characteristic is power and who uses his power to control and enslave the human race. Another anti-theist, Christopher Hitchens, once explained the reasons for his atheism like this. I think it would be rather awful if it was true, if there was a permanent, total, round-the-clock divine supervision and invigilation of everything you did. You would never have a waking or sleeping moment when you weren't being watched or controlled and supervised by some celestial entity from the moment of your conception to the moment of your death. It would be like living in North Korea. These are very real concerns that people have about God. However, Jesus reassures us in the midst of these concerns by revealing to us the true face and the true heart of the living God. Jesus is the God whose power is guided by his love to serve and to bless his people rather than to enslave and demand from them. That's why in the days leading up to the first Easter that Jesus is recorded as saying in Mark chapter 10, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The background to this saying from Jesus is his followers have been arguing among themselves, competing for positions of honour and authority in Jesus' forthcoming kingdom. Two brothers, James and John, had made the bold move of approaching Jesus to ask at his left and his right hands when he sits on his throne in power and glory. Upon learning about this, the other disciples begin to complain and criticise the two brothers. It's not that James and John were different, wanting something that the others didn't. It's just that they were annoyed that James and John shamelessly admitted what they wanted and reached out to grasp it before the others got hold of it. Before we climb atop our high horses and sit in judgment of the disciples, let's remember that we're human like them that we face the very same temptations of seeking glory and honour and power for ourselves. If you don't believe me that you face that real temptation, then just look at your social media profile and look at how you present yourself to the world. But Jesus sees this event as a teachable moment when he can both reveal something to his disciples about himself, but also God's design for exercising leadership and authority. Jesus teaches them, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Here Jesus is contrasting God's way of ruling with the way the pagan rulers rule. Just imagine and think about the dictatorial Caesars of Rome, the pharaohs of Egypt. Think about the elites of our own time. They parade their pomp. They display their power for all to see. They enjoy controlling the details of people's lives, compelling people to submit to their will. They lord their position and authority over others. But Jesus defiantly says that it should not be so for those who follow him. Instead, Jesus says that his followers are to follow his model and his example of leadership. While the Caesars demand to be served by slaves, instead, Christ descends to become a slave and to serve others. That's why he says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. In taking to himself the title, the Son of Man, Jesus is referencing a vision in the Old Testament of a mysterious figure who is both human and divine. The Son of Man is displayed approaching God's throne in heaven and is granted an eternal kingdom and power and glory. And this is a vision of the enthronement ceremony for the King of God's kingdom. And here in Mark chapter 10, Jesus is identifying himself as that prophesied King of Kings and Lord of Lords. However, Jesus is reassuring us also that from that position of supreme power and authority over this world and history, we do not have to hide, we do not have to fear, because Jesus is the king who uses his power to serve and bless his people, not to exploit and oppress them. 
Later on in the Gospel accounts, on the night before Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus dramatically enacts these words. He washes the feet of his disciples. He takes on the place of the lowest slave who had the smelly and dirty job of cleaning guests' feet after they were turned in from the streets, cold and dirt and excrement. Again, on this occasion, the disciples have been competing among themselves for the highest places of honour. None of them would descend to the lowest place and serve the others by washing their feet in this necessary way. And so Jesus does it instead. Jesus takes the lowest place. And afterwards he explains to them why he did this. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. A servant is not greater than his master. In washing his disciples' feet, Jesus is not just demonstrating what servant leadership looks like. It's not glamorous. It's messy. But Jesus is also previewing and explaining to his disciples the meaning of the events that are about to unfold the next day, which was Good Friday, when Jesus was going to die to wash us clean from the stains of sin and evil in our lives. The cross of Jesus shows us the God who did not use his ultimate power to serve and protect himself, but instead made himself vulnerable and laid down his life to serve and save his people from the oppressive power of evil in this world. This also reassures us about the significance of what happened next, when Jesus rose again from the dead on Easter Sunday, and 40 days later ascended to heaven and was crowned as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This reassures us that the Lord Jesus is the supreme authority whom we can trust, who loves us and has our best interests in mind. If you ever doubt that as you survey the wreckage of this world in rebellion against God and his kingdom, or as you look at the circumstances of your life, then you just need to look back to the cross to see the reality of Jesus' servant-hearted love for you and all that he would do to save you. Well, tonight we've been thinking about the crisis of meaning in our culture and our fascination with conspiracy theories. Although I've dismissed many of these theories out of hand, perhaps even one or two that you're favourable towards. Well, let me just say that even if I'm wrong, even if any of these conspiracy theories turn out to be true, that doesn't change the fact that the story they tell is not the story that ultimately defines the meaning of our lives or that determines our destiny. Instead, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead declares that the power of death has been overthrown, that with it the greatest power of every dictator in this world to instill fear in their people has been taken out of their hands. Jesus reigns, death is defeated, his love and his life has conquered death and evil, and one day soon his kingdom is going to come on the earth, bringing heaven down on earth causing all the bad and all the sad things to become untrue. This is the better story that defines your life and my life if you're trusting in Jesus. But maybe tonight you're here and you're listening and you've not yet put your trust in Jesus. You haven't yet asked him to be your God and to be your saviour. But the good news is that you can start tonight, this Easter Sunday night. You can give him the keys of your life. You can make his better story your story. You can place your hope in sharing his destiny rather than having to be the author of your own destiny. And so that's why Jesus offers the better story than the stories told by conspiracy theories. Hope you'll stick on with us this evening for a little bit longer and you'll submit some questions. Go to www.slido.com. Use our event reference number, which is 223 Eight double zero, two two three eight double zero. Submit your questions. See questions that other people have submitted and vote on them, and we'll have a go at answering them now. Well, let's uh, get stuck into your questions now. They've started to flow in. 
For top question so far is how do we tell apart a conspiracy theory from actual cover-ups by government corporations, for example, Nestle trying to hide their shitty practices in the third world? Well, obviously, a conspiracy theory is um, different to an actual conspiracy. So, for example, take um, take the famous Watergate cover-up. So, President Richard Nixon was spying on his political enemies and. Uh, orchestrated the break-in at the Democratic National um, Committee to plant bugs into the phones of um, the people in charge to listen to what they were doing. Um, and for a long time, I think it was over a couple of years, he managed to, and those around him managed to cover up the story until Carl Bernstein and the other chap at the Washington Post managed to expose what was going on and there were congressional hearings and the tapes came out. And then in the end, Nixon had to resign you had there a genuine, real conspiracy. Um, a conspiracy theory is different. A conspiracy theory looks at different things that happen, different events, and it tries to come up with explanations behind why that has happened. It's um, Sometimes it can be based on the evidence, um, and sometimes not. I think one way to tell about, one way to determine the difference between a conspiracy theory and something that's really happened is actually to watch how it develops over time. Jesus once said that you will know someone by the fruits of, fruits of their life. So don't just make a judgment on someone at the start, but observe them over time and see, does the fruit bear out? And so, for example, some people may have said that whenever the story began to break in the Washington Post about um, the, the Watergate break in and it was very interesting that uh, the people who had been arrested that night that they had um, connections with people in the president's office and they had money that came from the committee to elect the president by the way it was about a month ago we watched the film all the president's men which is just why it happens to be my mind a fabulous film um, some people could have said that um, Bernstein and his associate were just making up a conspiracy theory but over time, what happened was more and more and more evidence. More and more people spoke out um, and they were able to, to show, they were able to follow the money and prove the links between the, the, the burglars and people who were um, in senior positions around Nixon. And then we were able to get access to the tapes that primarily proved that Nixon knew about the break-in and the cover-up um, and, and, and many other naughty things that he got up to at that time. Conspiracy theory is different though. Conspiracy theory will begin, and it could be indistinguishable, it begins seeing something and see certain um, circumstantial evidence around about that seems to suggest, you know, there's something going on here. But what will very often happen is that as conspiracy theory will snowball. And if one lead dies, well then it will just go, it'll either just absorb it, explain away the, the problem, or it will just find another a way to fix it on a different person or a different factor or a different explanation. I guess a real, a true story is falsifiable. A conspiracy theory is almost impossible to falsify because people believe in them no matter what. Um, take the story of the, take the, take the conspiracy theory around the, the moon landings. Um, I remember as an undergraduate passing some time one afternoon when I should have been studying, um, watching Mythbusters, an episode of Mythbusters, where they went through um, all of the sort of key um, evidence that people have used over the years to say, see, the, the moon landing didn't happen. And they went through all of the different evidence, they did different scientific experiments and showed that in a vacuum it is possible that the flag would move because the, the, of the, the way that it, the, the, when, when the astronauts planted the flag they would have put their momentum into it and so that's why the flag in the video was moving even though there's no air on the moon to blow it. It's, it's the momentum that the, that the astronauts put into it and all sorts of other things like that, um, which, which was fascinating. But it's interesting that when you can be presented with all of the, of, of all the debunking and still people are like, nope, not listening, don't believe it. Um, it absolutely, it makes so much better sense to say that we didn't really land on the moon and it was all just um, a cover up and a conspiracy and done inside a Hollywood film studio. And so I think that's one of the key ways in which it, it, the, the conspiracy theories and true conspiracy are different is that a, 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 something that's true, that they might start the same, but one will follow the evidence and if the evidence leads in a direction that says, well, there's nothing to this, well, then they'll drop it. But a conspiracy theory will not. It will continue to snowball and build um, and um, 
perhaps even start to join up with other conspiracy theories. So it's what's one of the people talk today about the, the grand conspiracy theories where you've got three or four conspiracy theories and suddenly people make connections. This is what's happening with the QAnon phenomenon, um, which is a bundle of different conspiracies which have been going around for quite a long time, but then they've suddenly become fixated um, around a particular person, um, Donald Trump, as it was at the time. Um, so that's, that's one way to tell the difference. It is to observe the fruit, see how they respond over time, how they grow and develop, how they respond to evidence and to scrutiny, and particularly if they accept that they're wrong sometimes. That, that might be um, a way to distinguish the two. Let's move on. The second um, question, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, one of the letters of the New Testament, tells us that demonic forces are at work in this world. That verse tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities, against the cosmic rulers over this present darkness. Then the question asks, are we not justified in being at least sceptical of our government's intentions? Well, there are a couple of things tied in there. Um, let's first of all, just maybe um, not immediately jump from talking about the kingdom of darkness and its government and its organization and the demonic forces to immediately talk about our government. Um, I think that we, we, some of our politicians, some of our leaders might be a little bit offended just to have that tighter connection between the kingdom of darkness and what's happening at Holyrood or what's happening in Westminster or what's happening at Edinburgh Council. Um, at least one of our elders would probably be a little bit offended. Um, he's a local councillor. But I think we also need to, I, I, I do I, I, I agree, I agree with the thrust of this question, which is there, there is stuff going on behind the scenes. We live in a world which, there's a material world which, which we have access to through our five senses um, that we see and hear and touch and smell and taste. Um, but that's not all that there is. Um, there are things that we are un unaware of, just as there are parts of the colour spectrum that we cannot see with our eyes, ultraviolet for example, just as there are sounds which at differing frequencies we can't hear, like a dog whistle, um, so also the Bible leads us to believe that we are not just in a material, physical world, but we are also surrounded by an interlinked spiritual, immaterial world. Don Lennox, the professor of mathematics at Oxford University, in one of his books talks about the bias that we have today as a scientific people, the materialistic bias that if scientists start talking about, you know, we're looking for life out there in space, the SETI project, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, that we're looking for life out there. We believe there might be life on other planets. Well, you know, people take that somewhat seriously and think, well, yeah, this is, we're curious, we're interested to know, is there other life on other planets out there? Very interested, we'll send um, probes to Mars, like the, the most recent one just, uh, just landed last month. Um, but then the next point out, when Christians start talking about there being life out there, um, not on other planets, but actually in this world, but just spiritual beings, um, beings of mind rather than matter. The Bible would call them angels, and fallen angels are demons. Um, suddenly it's like, well, we, we don't believe in that nonsense anymore. Well, that just reveals something about the, the modern materialistic bias. Or that's not science talking, that's your philosophy talking, that's your, that's your implicit religion talking even if it doesn't have God involved. It's, it's a religion, a philosophy, a worldview. So I do believe that the Bible is telling the truth and it tells us that there is not just a physical material world, but there is an immaterial spiritual world, which is part, it's sort of, if you like, overlaid over our world. And there are beings at work, personal beings, beings that serve God, but also beings which have rebelled against God and which are determined to undo God's purposes in this world and to destroy God's good work in this world by ruining the lives of his people. Uh, demons, the kingdom of darkness. And to do that, some of what they do is they tempt human beings, they deceive human beings, and that also goes for human governments. They seek to deceive human governments. They want to lead human governments into policies that are dehumanizing of people and that cause destruction and death and misery. That's what the demons want. Um, they don't want our best interests at heart. They hate us because we're made in God's image and they, they, they know that we are the pinnacle of God's creation. And in their attempt to, to get back at God and to shake their fists in God's face, they will attack and destroy us if they possibly can. But you have to understand that while those forces are at work, um, 
they do not have direct control over our governments. Rather, they seek to infiltrate and influence through different people and forces, and they try to deceive and they try to, to lead astray. They, they seek to propagate lies. They, they, they're, they're, they're ultimately committed to an agenda which is anti-life. And that's why we need to pray for our leaders. That's why we need to pray for those who are in authority. First uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 2, I think. No, 2 or 3, I think it is. It talks about how that when, when, when the church gathers, the church should pray for all those who are in high authority. Um, they need wisdom. Um, they, 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 we need to be praying for them to, to have wisdom to discern truth from error, um, truth from lies, to have wisdom to be able to govern the nation effectively, to help people rather than to hurt people. Um, because while there's a lot of cynicism about politicians, you know, they're just in it for themselves, out for power, out for money, um, it's way more complicated than that. And, and so many of our politicians, they are genuinely there because they have hearts for the nation and they have ideas and passions and, po uh, and uh, passions uh, for a better country and to help people. Um, but seeking to stop them and seeking to undo that there are these demonic forces at work. And so yes, we should have a healthy cynicism and skepticism about, the, about our governments and their policies. We should ask questions. We are a democracy. We can ask questions of our elected leaders. If we don't like what they're doing, we can challenge them at the ballot box. We can write to them. We can lobby them. We can submit petitions to them. Um, we can visit them in their surgeries. Do all these good things. Participate, be a good citizen of the kingdom in which we live. But also they need our prayers because um, if you take seriously the fact that there is a spiritual battle going on, that, that, they, that, that one of the most effective tools that, the, that they have it to wreak, to, to affect lots of people's lives is to mislead our governments and to lead them back down stupid paths. Well, then we need to pray um, for our leaders that they would um, see through the lies and the deceptions and the evil designs of, of the enemy. So. There's probably more we could say there about what the kingdom of darkness is seeking to do, it's, what, where it's seeking to take world history and things. We can maybe go into that, we'll see what the questions are, but I've said enough, I think, um, just now. Let's uh, see another question. Next question is an important one, actually, that we deal with at this present time, and that's how do you know the information about the vaccine is misinformation? And then a suggestion that we check out um, a Dr. Tenpenny, uh, someone who I think I've come across. I think it's really important that um, we didn't get a chance last month to really dig into the whole question about the COVID vaccine. And I think it is quite important that we come back to think about that at this present time. I'm not a doctor, uh, not a scientist qualified. Um, and so the best thing that I can do for you is to suggest that you go to um, good sources to find truth and correct information, not misleading misinformation. Um, and a, a place that I really respect is a group called the Christian Medical Fellowship, a group of Christian doctors and uh, trained scientists. And um, they have done a lot of writing about the COVID vaccine. There was also a debate two weeks ago between um, a representative of CMF, Dr. John Wyatt. Dr. John Wyatt is um, a doctor of neonatal medicine down in London. Um, he's a Christian ethicist, someone whose books I've um, used for 10 years now. I, I, I hugely respect Dr. Wyatt and um, his expertise as a doctor. And he had a debate with um, actually another friend of mine, David Brennan, um, who's the leader of a pro-life organization called Brephos, the Greek word for child, infant. And they had a debate about the vaccine. And specifically, they were debating about the ethics, the Christian ethics of um, taking a vaccine which has been tested upon cell lines developed from an aborted fetus 40 years ago. Um, so they were having to debate about the ethics of benefiting from a vaccine which, as part of its development, there has been some testing on cell lines from an aborted child. David Brennan um, was arguing that from our strong convictions as Christians that um, from conception a fetus in the womb is a human being and is made in the image of God and is a person with potential, not just a potential person but a person with potential and uh, a part of the human family and so deserves our love and care and respect and should be protected if at all possible. 
he's arguing from that, well then, we should make a stand against this vaccine. We should refuse to take it as Christians because that's a way of us standing up for um, pro-life cause and our convictions. Dr. John Wyatt, however, was um, arguing against that and saying that actually there is a there is good Christian ethical thinking and resources over the centuries that says that um, it is still permissible to benefit from a vaccine, um, even though there are some questions about how it was tested in, in its development. And John has written a number of blogs that CMF linked to. There's also another doctor, I forget his name. Um, it's not going to come back to me uh, on the spot, but CMF have linked to it. And he's written seven or eight um, over the last few months blogs just in ex extraordinary depth and detail, sometimes going over my head about um, the virus, uh, about the vaccines, the different types of vaccines, what's going on with them, the issues, the ethical issues in them. Um, and so I would really strongly encourage you to go and make your, if you have questions about this, go and make yourself aware of this literature that's being written by the experts. Um, I'm not going to opine on it, um, other than to say that there is excellent stuff out there that can help you work through your questions. For me, my person, the biggest issue for me personally is the, the question about um, the, the, the development using, um, the testing as part of development on um, aborted cell lines. That was a huge question for me. Um, and my questions I felt were resolved um, over the last few months of doing reading and digging, um, engaging with Christians, Catholics, Protestants, um, Christian ethical thinkers, and coming to see that that, that is not um, something that I need to, in my conscience, feel bad about if, if when, I, when I receive my invitation to receive the vaccine, I will, I will take it. Um, so I would really encourage you to go to CMF, Christian Medical Fellowship, and read up um, on this, just the excellent resources that they have um, produced and made available. They also had a art, recent article with a full day conference with um, a dozen or so medical professionals exploring these things. Go and read that stuff if you really want to um, dig more into this issue. Get the right information, um, especially if you're writing on social media and you're expressing your opinions about this, please uh, make sure that you are engaging with good, trustworthy, reputable material um, as best as you can. So I hope that um, gives you some more to go on there as you explore that further. Next question. Does the Bible not teach that in the end times there will be great deception too? Yes, it does. The um, book of Second Thessalonians chapter 2 describes how in the last days, in the days, in, in the months and years prior to the return of the Lord Jesus to bring his kingdom on the earth, that there will be um, a tremendous um, tipping point towards evil in this world where God will allow evil to exert its influence in a way that he has not done so far. And that will be really the, 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 that's the moment whenever everything will come to light, the big revealing moment on whose side are you really on? The reason why God will allow this intensification of evil and deception is because this is the time to reveal which side are you really on. Before Jesus returns with his kingdom, before the great day of judgment, God is going to call out his people and he's also going to reveal those who are op opposed to him and to his kingdom. So um, the Bible leads us to believe. The Bible, as I said last month, is not just a book of history that tells us the truth about things that have happened in the past and it does that, but the Bible is also a book of prophecy. It, it, it's unique in this way that it actually foretells events that will ha happen in the future. Much of the Bible's prophecies a very, very high percentage, I think 80, 85% of the Bible's prophecies have already been fulfilled to us from to us in the 21st century, their history. But we actually can go back and see that the Bible in the past has predicted events that would take place hundreds of years in the future in incredible depth and detail, and they've been fulfilled. Take, for example, the events around the birth of the Lord Jesus and his life and his death and resurrection and his ascension. All of those things were predicted in scripture centuries before they happened and they were fulfilled in exquisite detail in history. We now look back on it. And just as the Bible has been proven to be correct in the past in its prophecies, I also believe the Bible will be proven to be correct and accurate about its prophecies about the final days as well, the days prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus with his kingdom. The Bible leads us to believe that in those latter days, there will be an incredible um, centralization of global power and uh, authoritarianism, um, 
in many ways, human society will turn away from God in, un, in, in a new, unprecedented way, rejecting God's moral laws, God's um, principles and values. People will live for themselves. There will also arise at that time um, a world leader um, who will be charismatic and powerful and he will rule the world stage and he will, he will gather a, a coalition of nations around him and uh, he will deceive the world. He will ultimately claim to be God himself and will set himself up and demand to be worshipped by the people of the world and its citizens. Just as in ancient Rome, the emperor claimed to be a god and there was a state religion and everyone in the emperor empire had to go to the local temple and sprinkle incense on the altar as a sign of loyalty to Caesar or else they would be punished. So in the last days, this final world leader will um, make himself out to be God, will deceive the world through being able to perform miracles, counterfeit miracles, empowered by the evil one himself. Perhaps even it seems to be indicated that he will be assassinated or he will, be, he will die and be injured, but then he will stage a false resurrection and he will actually at that time be empowered directly by Satan, the evil one, the devil. And he will lead the world um, in rebellion against God, demanding to be worshipped, demanding the loyalty of the world, that everyone would receive a mark on their right hand or, or, or their forehead um, as a sign of loyalty to him. Some of the scriptures talk about this character as the Antichrist. And he will in the end um, be only stopped by the return of Jesus to save his people um, from the, 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 the onslaught of, of evil. And so there is a trajectory of, of global history, which is towards centralization, toward away from democracy and towards authoritarianism, um, towards the centralization of power, towards, um, well, as we've seen in, through the digital re revolution, just uh, an ability to track and control people and um, to, to, where people will not comply with, um, the government and its demands, well then they will be shut out of social life and economic life. Um, and so that is the trajectories that we, we are told in prophecy where we're going to end up. And we can kind of see trajectories in loads of different ways that, that tend that way. Just it's really, really important for us to understand that, that not to prematurely jump and say, well, we've got there now. This is, this is the end and this person is the Antichrist and this thing is the mark. We've got to be really careful we don't, we don't get pre, uh, presumptuous about that. Christians have done that unfortunately over the dec decades and much of the reason why people are not very interested in Bible prophecy is today is because people have been obsessed with this in the past, have made all these predictions and assumptions and they've been wrong and that's just brought, uh, just discredited the whole subject. Um, I, I think that we can avoid the problems and but keep, keep the things the Bible does talk about here. And so some people today in our present time are concerned about the, 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 the COVID passport idea that unless you have um, something on your phone or a piece of paper that says, you know, I've had my two vaccines, well, then you can't participate in social life. You can't go down to the local, um, you can't go to the theatre, can't go to the pub, can't go to the, the football match. Um, and some people see, well, you know, there's going to come a day whenever if I don't get the mark, well, then I'll be shut out of social life. I won't be allowed to buy or sell. I won't be able to participate as a citizen. Um, in a normal way and possibly, possibly that, that sort of ID, ID card, that sort of um, ID, that idea, possibly it's part one of the trajectories, possibly. But the key thing is that it's, it's not the end yet. It's not the thing itself, it's not the mark. And so getting the COVID vaccine is not, we, we asked that question last month, is the vaccine the mark of the beast? The answer is no, it's not the mark, it's medicine. Um, there are questions about the ethics of it, go and do your research on CMF um, about that. Is the COVID vaccine the mark? No, it's not, but perhaps it's on a trajectory. Um, key thing is the Bible's book of history has been right about the past. It accurately in detail tells about the past. It reports to us events truly and accurately about the past. It's also a book of prophecy. Most of those prophecies are now history to us, they're past, but just as the Bible has been right about things before, it will also be proven to be right about things in the end. And so we, you, you are right to be aware of the signs of the times, to be aware of the trends and directions. Just be careful not to jump to conclusions prematurely. So keep praying, keep looking up, keep remembering, keep 
above all, don't get focused on the signs of the times. Don't get fixated on that story. Get focused on the big story, which is that God loves us. And he sent his son to become one of us. And he's died for our sins. And he's been raised from the dead. And he lives in heaven today. And he reigns for us. And he's coming again for us. And we'll bring his kingdom and make all things new. That is the story that defines us. That is the story that we have set our hope in. Um, not the stuff down here. Jesus wins. That is how the story ends. Let's, let's be more excited about that than we are obsessed, uh, analysing and trying to predict the stuff down here. Let's, uh, let's keep going. We've got time for our, uh, another question or two. Let's see what we've got here. Are there any conspiracy theories around Christianity that we should be wary of? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, I think there are a lot of, I think there is a lot of um, misinformation around about Christianity that you should be aware of. That there are many false accusations against the Bible, that it's not reliable, it's been disproved. Um, I think that you, you should be aware of that and should be aware of the great scholarship that there is that, um, that demonstrates the incredible accuracy and reliability of the Bible. Um, a very simple book um, to, to start off thinking about that is um, The Case for Christ, um, which goes through the evidence for the Gospels and the person of Jesus from history by Lee Strobel, fabulous book um, way in. A, a shorter book, but one which is a slightly just a little bit more involved is by Dr. Amy Orr Ewing, um, Why Trust the Bible? Um, explore that. Um, there are other sorts of conspiracy theories, like there's the Darren Bryan conspiracy theory, that the church made up the idea that Jesus was the son of God centuries after the events, that Jesus was just actually a simple teacher. He died tragically, uh, but, but centuries later, the church um, invented the myths around about Jesus. Um, again, that's a conspiracy theory and it's, it's nonsense, it's lies. Um, from the very earliest times, um, the Bible records the evidence that from the earliest times, shortly after the death of Jesus, that Christians believed that he was God. Some of the Roman historians of the time, like Tacitus and Subitonius and Lucian, um, they, they also record that the Christians worship Jesus as a God um, from the earliest times. And so again, you've got conspiracy theory there, which is full of misinformation against Christianity, which just needs to be debunked. Um, so often in these question nights, and certainly in past years, we've we've looked at some of the some of the some of the some of the misinformation around about Christianity that it is um, that it's racist, that it's homophobic, that it's transphobic, um, that it's sexually restrictive, um, that it's bad for the world and the environment, and all sorts of things. That was just some of the topics we looked at last year. Um, so there are all sorts of there's all sorts of misinformation around about Christianity. Um, there are all sorts of misunderstandings that people have about the Bible and Jesus and, uh, and the Christian faith. And part of the work that, that we do in apologetics is giving an answer and uh, explaining and uh, cutting through the misinformation with truth and evidence that shows the, the, the reality and the veracity and the plausibility of Jesus and his better story. Um, so there's there's a there's a there's some contribution uh, an answer to that question. Thank you for that. Let's see what else we've got. There's a comment here. Um, median age of death for COVID is 82.4 years, older than the average life expectancy. Yet we have to have the whole population vaccinated. Obviously, we get suspicious. Um, and I think that part of the Part of the thinking there behind, I'm not an epidemiologist, um, I, I have to resist my temptation to be an armchair epidemiologist. Um, I've been rebuked about that a few times by various people just saying, you're a, you're a minister, don't be an armchair epidemiologist, so message received. But I do believe that the reason for that is because this is a virus that can be carried by the apparently healthy and can spread then to the most vulnerable that then having the vaccine for everybody is a way of introducing herd immunity, that phrase. Um, that just as we vaccinate everybody from measles or um, small, well, do smallpox, but do, we, 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 there, there are other diseases that we vaccinate as many people in the population as possible to reduce the ability of the, of the virus in nature, being able to spread and find people who um, are vulnerable to it. And so I believe that is the purpose for everyone getting the vaccine it is about introducing herd immunity into the population. I think we've got time for one more. Um, uh, 
What is the best way to help someone who seems to be caught up in a conspiracy theory? Just giving them the correct facts doesn't seem to be effective. This is a really good question to finish on. Thank you for putting it in. This is hard um, because conspiracy theories, because they are tied into meaning, this is how I make sense of the world. This is, I people get a sense of security from having a conspiracy theory because suddenly everything that seems out of control too big, complex to understand, suddenly it makes sense to them. And that's, that, that makes, brings a great deal of comfort and security. And so in debunking the conspiracy that you're trying, you're, you're asking someone to leave a place where they feel comfortable and secure back into insecure and, and discomfort. We don't like that. We don't want to do that. Also, conspiracy theory can be, can be a place where we find community. Um, it can also be a place where we, where, where, where we feel good because we feel in control, that we're not deceived like everybody else. We're in the know, we've got the truth. Um, and so of course, people's natural defenses are going to be switched on to, that they're not necessarily going to be just, they're not just engaging this logically, mentally with the facts, they are deeply existentially and emotionally invested in this thing. But then the parallel is with anyone who we are seeking to share the Christian faith with who is not a believer. Someone who is existentially and emotionally invested, just like Thomas Nagel. Nagel says, if you remember back to the talk, one of the things he talks about in the book, Mind and Cosmos, says, you know, one of the things that most disturbs me is that some of the most intelligent people I know are, are believers in God. But I don't want to believe in God. I don't want the universe to be that way. He's, he's like existentially and emotionally invested in him being the author and controller and Lord of his life and destiny. He doesn't want there to be a God whom he has to give an account to. He doesn't want to have to listen to God and make God's story his story. He wants to write his own story. He's just exceptionally honest about it, which is why I love Nagel. Um, how do you engage with anyone who is deeply existentially and emotionally invested in something which, which is not true? Just talking facts to them doesn't work because it's not, the problem isn't up here, it's down here. First thing, pray. You can't change people's hearts. You can't even change their minds, but God can. And so you should bring those people before God and be asking for God to, to soften their heart, to open them up, to, to trust you and to listen to you and to talk with you. Second thing is, listen, invite them to talk and to share. Because if, if, if you just go in there saying, you're an idiot, <laughs> let me see, I've come to set you straight. Again, defenses are up. You need to listen. You need to let them share. Perhaps they don't have anyone who's willing to listen to them. Everyone looks at them funny and thinks, right, you just need to get your tinfoil hat off your head. But you can listen, you can draw them out, you can ask questions, you can ask the deeper questions about, you know, how does this make you feel? Why, why does this help you? Why do you believe this is good news? And then you can begin to, when you, when you understand what the deeper things are, the anchors that people, the, the, the deeper foundations of people's hearts and lives, then you can begin to, to say, well, you know, that's a really bad thing to build your life and your security, your identity, your hope upon, because look, there's all this evidence that it's wrong. But did you know that there is a better place to find your security? There's a better place, to, there's a better story in which you can find your identity and your hope and your meaning. Let me share that with you. There's a helpful secular um, psychologist called Jonathan Haidt, and he talks about this, that human beings are not just brains on a stick, but we are, we, we're deeply emotionally, um, instinctively invested creatures. And he has this image, image that we are like a, a, a rider on top of an elephant. The rider is the, your rational mind, the elephant is just your gut, your emotions, everything else. And he points out that, that usually what happens is that we, we re react instinctively, emotionally from our gut, and then later our sort of mind catches up and tries to justify that reaction. You don't change someone's course by talking primarily, first of all, to their rider, because the elephant's just so much bigger. Instead, what you've got to do is you've got to draw alongside and be a friendly elephant. And as you gain the trust and listening ear of the elephant, then you can help to, to steer the one on a different course. Um, if you want to read some more about that, if you go and type into Google Solas, um, Jonathan Haidt, and my name, David Nixon, um, you'll get one of my articles where I, I, I go into, I explain and walk you through what uh, Haidt's saying there and how you can do that with people. 
So I hope that helps um, answer that question. Thank you so much for all of your questions that you've submitted. I'm sorry I've not got through all of them this evening. We've covered lots of fun, interesting, um, slightly controversial things this evening, but thank you for um, joining us this Easter Sunday night as we've explored a better story, a better story than conspiracy theories, the story of the Lord Jesus, that he is Lord and God, that he reigns over heaven and earth, and that he is the one who has authority over life and death. But you don't just have to know him as Lord and God, but also as saviour and friend. That is the invitation he makes to you, the God you can trust, the God who loves you and cares for you. Next month, we're going to be back. We're actually going to be back in person next month in the building, 65 High Street in Edinburgh. So you can go on Eventbrite, Corrobbers, just type to go Eventbrite, Corrobbers. You can book to come in person next Sunday, next uh, next month, the uh, 2nd of May um, at 7 p.m. Come in person if you like, and we'll also live stream that event live, live stream the event live, obviously. And you'll be able to, if you're not with us in person, you can still submit your questions um, and we'll answer them. But come in person if you can and we'll have a great night together. We're gonna to be thinking about a better story, um, science. Does it have all the answers to life's questions? Can it solve all our problems? I wrote the talk just on Thursday and it's uh, gonna be a fun night again. So come and join us next month. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. God bless you. Enjoy your um, holiday tomorrow. and We hope to see you again soon. Good night. <laughs>